Good morning. Morning. Welcome to worship today. Uh, for those uh, who will be watching this online at some point, today is October the 18th. <laughs> what? 25th. 20, 25th. 25th. Okay. <laughs> so if you're watching, this is our service from October 25th. Uh, we hope that you are, are ready with uh, your wine and bread for Holy Communion. We're going to begin our worship now by singing our our God. And if our God is with us, then who can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, who can stand against? Who can stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger. All right, it's time for joys and concerns. Good to see all of you here today. 
And for those of you joining us online, now that I know I have the right week, uh, today is the celebration of the Reformation, uh, which happened 1517 on October the 31st. Um, and uh, several people are wearing red, like I suggested. Even Salvio has on bright red shoes in honor of Reformation, right, Salvio? <laughs> Just nod your head, yes. Okay, and um, so Salvio, uh, was, do you have some news to tell us? You don't know? Your, your mom got married yesterday. Congratulations to uh, Dane and Rachel. So they got married at home yesterday, and congratulations. Um, let's see. What else do we need to know about today? Next Saturday, October 31st, which also happens to be Halloween, uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to uh, meet together out here in the backfield uh, for a community event for prayer. Uh, several pastors from uh, our church and other churches will be here to offer prayers of unity in our community, in our world, and in our nation. That will be at 2 o'clock. I was told it might only be about 40 minutes or so. So that's next, next Saturday, 2 o'clock, in the field on the other side of this wall. So uh, come by and join us. You might uh, bring your own uh, little chair with you if you want to sit. Uh, but you'll hear from uh, several, several pastors from several churches in our community. Our ministerium is doing this. Uh, and, uh, you know, we all need a time to pray together. And it will be a good symbol of the unity of the church uh, in the midst of everything that's been going on. So uh, that's next Saturday. In our prayer concerns, I want you to remember today in prayer, um, <clears throat> Julie Peterson. Julie uh, had surgery this uh, past week. She is at home recovering. Uh, she is uh, doing well from everything that I have been texting uh, with her about. Uh, also, uh, Janet McIntosh is at home recovering from surgery. And Dorothy Hill, Hall, Dorothy Hall is uh, at... Emerald Trace uh, doing rehab from her recent surgery a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then prayers for uh, a couple of families uh, that experienced loss this week. We pray for uh, Amanda and Brad Wilson. Uh, Brad's father, Clyde, was laid to rest uh, this past Tuesday. Also prayers for Tony Stell and Steve Morline. Uh, Steve's mother, uh, 90 plus years old, uh, passed away last week. They had the funeral, I think it was on Thursday. So prayers for them. Um, and that's our prayer concerns. I want to remind you that in upcoming events, we do have uh, another fireside, what do we call it? Fireside Fellowship, where you bring your s'mores and um, your, the stuff to make s'mores with. And we're going to gather around two or three fire pits out over here near the picnic shelter starts at, uh, I think it's 7 o'clock. Uh, so that is coming up on November the 6th. Come and join us out there for that activity. Did you have fun last time? Emma, Abby, did you all have fun at uh, Fireside? Yeah, was, were, were there a lot of people there? Yeah. So come and join us. So, um, all right. And then all the other news and notes for the week you'll find in your weekly banner. Uh, if you are online watching, you can download this from the hopefulchurch.org uh, website. It's uh, listed right there. Just click on the uh, link and it will take you right to the PDF that has the readings for the day and also has all of our announcements. Okay, so we are now... Oh, and one last thing, I forgot this. <laughs> yeah, I turned around to look at Kelly to say, is there anything else? Uh, she's not here, is she? So I want to tell you what she's doing this morning. So while we're worshiping here, she is at Hebron Lutheran, and um, she is installing their new pastor, Michael Stoops. Uh, she already knew him um, in California during mission trips. They did some work together. So she knew him, and when he asked us to do the uh, installation, we said, well, we both can't do it because we're kind of busy at this time. And since she already knew him, I said, you go do it because that, that's got to be a joy to be able to do that. I've done quite a few, and it's, uh, it is. So prayers for, hopeful, for Hebron Lutheran Church and their new pastor, Michael 
stoops. All right. Any other announcements? Did I miss anything? Okay. We're going to begin now uh, with confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our failures, fears, and weaknesses to God, asking that we be restored to wholeness and peace. And let us together confess our sins. God, who cares for all, we confess that we have not loved you and have not cared for ourselves, our neighbors, or the earth you created. Forgive our lack of care and our failure to attend to your creation in us and around us. Take away our fear and our weakness and make us strong witnesses in word and action to your redeeming love. Amen. Our God is merciful, slow to anger, and, and rich in steadfast love. And I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of Jesus, who, is, who has restored us to God, our maker, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be renewed to wholeness of life. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And so let us pray together. O oh Lord, our God, arrange the course of this world that peace may come and your tranquil church rejoice through greater service. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we hear from the gospel according to St. John. We're going to hear from the 8th chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. This is the gospel lesson for Reformation every year. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone how is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time for the children's message. I have forgotten how to do all this by myself. Uh -huh. Didn't have it out and ready. So, sorry the pause out there in uh, Facebook land. Um, hey, by the way, I had heard uh, from folks uh, and from folks out there that um, our service is not live on Facebook. I mean, I'm sorry. Our service is not live on YouTube, and I know some people tuned in to YouTube to watch the service, uh, which it was when we were not doing a live service, it was posted on Saturday night so they could watch it anytime on Sunday morning. So now it gets posted after the service today, it'll be posted on YouTube. So if you have somebody that tells you they can't find it on, uh, yeah, Jeannie was one of them. If, they can't, if you can't find it on YouTube, it will be there later in the day. So keep that in mind. All right. Hey, you two. Come on up. Right, can you sit right here? Any other kids want to come up? All right. Adam, I'm glad you're on the front row. See? Big kid over here. All right, friends, I'm going to draw a picture. And I want to see who can figure out what it is. And I don't know how well this is going to show up on... I'm going to make this hard for Mr. Smith, who's back there running the camera. All right, Mr. Smith. Can, can they see this out there? It's a heart. 
Can they see it? Good. It's a heart. So what's a heart about? About love. Anything else? Oh, she's looking at like, what? No, I'm not so sure about that. It's about love. But let me tell you something about our heart. All right. We, uh, as human beings, we have a, a heart problem. Did you know that? I'm not talking about a physical heart problem. I'm talking about another kind of heart problem. And that heart problem is called sin. And sin is anything that we do that separates us from God's love and separates us from loving our neighbor. You know what I mean? It's like when you get mad at your brother, when you get mad at your brother, did you know that's, that's, one, that's a sin? You didn't know that, did you? Did you know that when you hit your sister, that that's a sin? Did you know that when your mom tells you to clean up your room and you don't do it, that that's a sin? Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah, you did? <laughs> I hope that helps, Mom and Dad. Uh, so listen, here's what happens. Oh, okay, Aiden, you don't look like you're going along with that. You, well, you are forgiven. So that's why we start out our worship service with confession, because we remind ourselves that we do sin, we think of those sins, and here's what happens to our heart. So, all right, Sephora, you get mad at your brother. That starts to darken your heart. Savio, you hit your sister. So that darkens another part of the heart. You didn't clean your room, did you? <laughs> All right. Uh, Aiden, what did you say you did? Oh, you hit your sister. Oh, no, I'm running out of dark. Can you see this out there? So the heart's starting to get darker and darker. Sin causes our heart. It, it causes a heart problem, right? Are you getting this? And because we sin a lot, we do. I do. So I'm just telling you, don't feel bad, okay? I don't hit my sister because she lives in Virginia. But <laughs> when I'm with her, I do. Yeah, okay. So uh, so that's, so are you understanding now that sin causes a heart problem? All right, good. Now, what fixes the heart? What? Getting rid of sin. How do we get rid of sin? Saying you're sorry. You confess it. You uh, you ask for forgiveness. So if you hit her, you you have to ask for forgiveness later, right? Uh, and if you don't clean your room, you, you need to ask for forgiveness. And Aiden, you probably have to ask for forgiveness a lot. Yeah, okay. I'm not picking on you. But so when you ask for forgiveness, and forgiveness is given, given both by a person you have hurt and by God, what happens to the heart? Sin is forgiven, and, oh, and now the heart is all cleaned up again, right? But as soon as that happens, what happens? It starts, we sin again, don't we? So, you see this is kind of a pattern of our life and, and then we ask for forgiveness and Jesus says you are forgiven we ask for forgiveness from our neighbor our neighbor says you are forgiven we live this rhythm of God's grace which is to seek forgiveness from those we have hurt and that's, that's what life is about learning that lesson I think that's what reformation might be about and we're going to talk more about that in the sermon here in a minute so let's bow our heads. Yes. Oh, it chased you. Oh, I'm sorry. Did they? Did did you let them know? Oh, your dad scared him away. That's another method, isn't it? Okay. All right. Thank you.
All right, let's bow our heads and fold our hands and let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day when you remind us that sin is very much a part of our lives and it darkens our heart, it darkens our love. And so we ask that you help us to restore relationships and to live in a forgiven world where every day is a chance to start over and begin with a fresh, clean heart that is sown into your love. And for this, we give you thanks and praise. And all of God's children say, Amen. All right. I'm sorry. There's the heart. Y'all didn't get to see it. You know what he's playing? Change my heart? No. Created me a clean heart. That's a great song to remember that. Oh, you went back to your mom and dad. Okay. I noticed that, uh, that the two girls are separated today. Marianne, are, are you the buffer zone? Good. All right. Um, let's begin with a prayer. May the words in my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so I got to tell you something. I was reading something, and it made me think about uh, um, a saying from the book of Blair that you want to know about today. All right, if, if you haven't read that book yet, because I haven't published it, I can't publish it until I'm long gone from here, because otherwise I'd have to change a lot of names. Here's, here's, and it's in, in chapter 10, verse 23, it says, you will not have to wear masks forever. Just want you to know that. There will come a day when they will be gone. All right, just wanted to reassure you that this, this is, uh, yeah, it's, it's here. We're dealing with it. Uh, all right. I am relatively certain. I can't say for sure. But I'm relatively certain uh, today is Reformation. Uh, and you'll remember the event that started the Reformation was that Martin Luther wanted to have a debate about practices in the church. In fact, he had 95 different points that he wanted to debate. You can look it up online. It's called the 95 Thesis. Thesis, T-H-E-S-E-S. -E so he, he posted, he nailed them on the door of the church at Wittenberg in, uh, in, um, in Germany. He nailed them on the door, which was what you did to, ha to encourage people to show up and have a debate about these things that he was thinking. And I'm relatively certain that when he posted those 95 theses on October 31st, 1517, that he was hopeful that he, that he would be able to start a fruitful and lively debate that would that would hopefully lead to some changes in the medieval Catholic Church. And then what actually happened was the beginning of a firestorm that caused schism in the church, leading him and other reformers to be uh, removed from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and it also left Luther and his compatriots um, having to think about how to be church with all of these ideas that they had about reforming the church. And so change happened quickly. Change happened dramatically in his lifetime. But I want to say this up front. Don't you think, or let me ask you this question, don't you think that the church always needs to be in the process of reforming. Yeah. Uh, I watched an episode of Bar Rescue. Anybody, anybody else a Bar Rescue fan? Yeah, so I was watching about um, a restaurant in, uh, I think it was in Silver Spring, Maryland. It was in the business district, and this restaurant was uh, had a pirate theme to it in the middle of all these office buildings. And unfortunately, they weren't having a lot of business because they were totally pirate-themed. They talked like pirates, they dressed like pirates, they served dishes that they thought pirates would eat. Well, to a, a, a very uh, 
to, to people on their lunch break in a business district, do you think they went there to talk pirate? Nah, they didn't. Do you think the people came back at night from the, from the suburbs of that town to uh, partake in a, a pirate um, festival? Nah. And so the woman was losing uh, $400,000 a year on her business and having to live in the basement of her parents' house with her teenage daughter. So um, John shows up, and he totally changes the theme of the bar. He makes it a bar that is perfectly suited to the needs of all the young urban professionals in all of these office buildings surrounding this restaurant. And she wasn't happy. In fact, after about a week after he had left, they turned it back into a pirate bar, and the concluding remark on the show was, and she still lives in her parents' basement. We always need to be rethinking how we do things, where we are, how the world around us has changed, because when this church was built, what was around here? Trees and a few settlers. Got it? So they had to start thinking about how to be church. So, Pastor Francis Chan, uh, who's written, a, what's the book, Love? Crazy Love. Wrote a book called Crazy Love. Great book. If you haven't read it, look it up. Uh, so, but he, like many other pastors, like myself included, uh, he, he had a vision about church. Uh, basically, it's a desire for the church. And I want to share with you what he wrote. But what I am wanting is to see a pure church where people are devoted, they're serious, and they understand what it means to really follow Jesus. And then we can really be a light to the world. Would you agree that if we are to continue to be a reforming church in the world, that we really need to think about how we, as the people of God, are the light of Jesus in the world around us? That's a good question, isn't it? Something for you to think about and pray about. Don't you think that maybe that's what Jesus is asking of his people? That'd be us. So I want to take you to a scene in a doctor's office, your cardiologist. And of course, you walk in, you got all the x-rays up, and charts and stuff on the wall, and he starts uh, to talk to you. Uh, his face is grim. His face is resolute. And he says to you, uh, your heart is so severely damaged that you will surely die without a transplant. And so I placed your name on the waiting list, and in a few months, we'll schedule the surgery, and when it's over, God willing, you'll be healed. No more gasping for breath when you walk across the room no shooting pains, you'll be your old self again, only better. Eventually, the day that you dread and hope for arrives. Get to the hospital, they say. We have a new heart for you. And so most of your energy and thoughts are focused on yourself, the surgical and the medical team, your family, and just getting through this very radical procedure. But late at night, perhaps the night before the surgery, maybe even a few days before the surgery, as you wait for <clears throat> the pain medication to kick in or, or for the anti-rejection drugs to reduce the fever, there in a silent room late at night, you have a lot of other questions. Like, <clears throat> who was this person whose heart is now yours? Was it a man or a woman? Was he or she white, black, Asian, something else? Was the person Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist? And what did the person do for a living? What hopes and sorrows did he or she bear? And how did the person live? And how did he or she die? And what does it mean that you bear a living portion of another person's body there within your chest? What? does it mean that you live only because another person died and allowed a part of his or her own body to be given to a total stranger? 
does something of that person's history or that person's essence or that person's soul pass into you with the living tissue? How will you be changed? Not, not just by the surgical procedure, but by this astonishing, deeply intimate gift that is going to beat within your chest for the rest of your life. What will it be like knowing that each breath you take, each word you speak, each thought and gesture and action is possible only because of this new heart, this gift of a stranger powering your body. So perhaps, half embarrassed, you share some of your questions with a doctor or someone else and you're assured that no, you're suddenly not going to gain the characteristics of a different gender or race. You're not suddenly going to start watching the old movies and sitcoms you'd heard that the other person liked. In fact, your body is constantly going to try to reject the new heart, deeming it an alien, uh, dangerous, and other thing within your body. And it's only those anti-rejection drugs you take that will allow that new heart to become a part an integral part of your own body. And perhaps the doctor was right. This heart transplant has allowed you to be your old self again, though wiser, deeper, and a lot more grateful. Do you have it? Can you think about that? So I want you to imagine another scene. Yeah, come to church with your new baby. And you hear disturbing words. Your baby's heart, not her physical one, but her real heart, you know, the seat of her soul and the core of her identity is as deeply damaged as yours was. And without a heart transplant, she will surely die. But there is great hope, the pastor continues. Our Lord Jesus has promised to give your child his very own heart just as he gave it to you and to me. <clears throat> Let's schedule the baptism for next Sunday, shall we? All right, you there with me now? Because this gets interesting. You sit there, and you're reeling with questions. My beautiful baby die? Deeply damaged as my own heart? What didn't my parents tell me? Heart transplant? What are you talking about? Isn't there something less radical, less... Dangerous? Our, our real heart? What's going on? And the pastor patiently answers your questions. If our physical heart is wounded, clogged, malformed, it affects the whole body, doesn't it? If it fails, the whole body dies. And in the meantime, before the transplant, you are in bondage. You're a slave to pain to the terrible limitations enforced by the malfunctioning heart, and without a transplant, you die in that bondage. Sin is like that. It's like terrible heart disease of the soul. It keeps us in bondage. We keep hurting ourselves. We keep hurting one another, and we, and we anger and grieve God by our sin. And even if we wanted to live healthy, sinless lives, we couldn't. Just as when you have a failing heart, even giving up smoking, eating right, and, and mild exercise, they only postpone the inevitable. Without a real heart transplant, we're doomed to die in our bondage to sin. Amen? I just have to see if you're still awake. You know, with your mask on, I can't tell if you are sleeping behind them. And you look at the pastor and you say, but my baby, she hasn't lived long enough to sin. Is she born with this? The pastor nods, yeah. It's like being born with a really terrible heart defect. Even though she's being fed the best baby food and is getting all of her shots and seems healthy, she could have a condition that is life-threatening, right? Right? Well, that's the human condition. There, in the depth of what makes us human, and following God's laws and commandments, well, that just kind of that kind of takes the edge off the the worst side, the worst of the side effects. 
But listen, it only postpones the inevitable because only a heart transplant from our God can correct it. After all, since we're all in the same boat, who else could do it? You think hard for a few minutes. With a regular heart transplant, you're still the same old self, just healthier. You don't change colors, or you don't change religion, or you don't change gender because of it. What about this? This baptismal transplant you're talking about. And the pastor beings, ah, that's the big surprise right there. Jesus puts his own heart in us. He died under sin's load and bare and rose again and is forever immune to its deadly effects. His heart is completely in tune with the heart of his heavenly Father. God's intentions are engraved on Jesus' heart. His is the heart of God's Son, God's beloved Son. And when we receive it, we're not only set free from slavery to sin and death and, and the power of evil, we are counted as members of God's family too. He knows the justice and the mercy of God deep in his heart. And when we receive it, we begin to know God that way also. We don't stay our same old selves when we get a heart transplant in baptism. We begin day by day to be and grow into the stature of Jesus. No, no, let, let me rephrase that. We're made part of his own body when his heart is put in us. And he will never, ever reject us as, a, as foreign and dangerous. Sin and death will never, ever have the last word over you and I. We're his when we receive his heart, life, and future from God's hand. Hmm. Well, don't we need anti-rejection drugs, though, you ask, kind of half kidding. I mean, this is a lot more radical than real. Uh, I mean, physical heart transplant surgery. That's why we are given his body and his blood every single week. You know, almost 1,900 years ago, a great saint called communion the medicine of, immor of immortality. Maybe he was more right than he knew. Because being here in worship in person with other transplant recipients, constantly hearing what God has done that we could never ever do for ourselves and what he wants to do for all his people and receiving his presence in the bread and in the wine, his promise that we're forgiven, all our attempts to reject him, that's what keeps us healthy after this great heart transplant and we're promised that it will last not in our physical lifetime, but it will last forever. As Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed forever. Dear friends, that isn't a hypothetical conversation, you see. It's one that our Lord, I believe, has with each of us every week. And we hear it very pointedly on this Reformation Sunday. And maybe, maybe it is the deepest meaning of the Reformation of the church that always, throughout the world, the church announces that it is comprised solely of people who live with a new heart in them, the heart of Christ. They are alive solely through His grace. And anyone who believes this and is baptized, who received this incredible, intimate gift of God's own life, will live forever as a child of God's house. For if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And now, life is lived for Him. And that's the beginning of how we share the light of Jesus Christ with our families, and our communities, and the world. May we truly be the light of Christ that he has called us to be on this Reformation and every day. Amen.
us stand together and profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will, he will come, come again, again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. It's time for the offering. Offering is a very important part of our worship of God. It is returning to God what he has first given us. And so... Um, we can't pass around plates. I want to remind you that there was a white and gold box uh, by the front door. Uh, it will now be by the, the door as we leave out of the fellowship hall today. Uh, for those of you at home, you can mail uh, a, a gift to us. You can go online. Uh, we have quite a few people that are now giving online. Uh, and, or you can try that um, thing with your smartphone called texting. Uh, it's a pretty cool invention, isn't it, texting? Yeah. <laughs> was that the texting noise? Oh. Okay. Mine says, help me, I'm stuck in your pocket. But uh, <laughs> So uh, just that's uh, for all of you. I want to say thank you for your continued uh, gifts to the Min Mission and Ministry of Hopeful. And because of you, we are able to still uh, participate in ministries beyond ourselves, uh, such as uh, we have sent, um, we're sending out about, oh, $3,000 this week to uh, three different ministries in our community, and I don't have the list in front of me to tell you who they are, but uh, we, we do this uh, as often as we can um, to uh, to our ministry partners and the ministries that you work with uh, in, in the community. also need to mention today another offering. Uh, I have to ask, how many of you here this morning have participated in making quilts in the last year, since last October? Just raise your hands. Okay, that's quite a few of you. Heather, that was real quick. Oh. Yeah, Marion, yeah, raise your hand. Uh, thank you for your hard work. I don't know if you know this or not, but um, last year, <clears throat> before COVID, we were able to make about 340 quilts. Uh, of course, COVID has uh, kind of closed down some of our work, but the work is still being done. They have made 251 quilts in this last year. Uh, many hours and many acts of love to be able to do those. And today, uh, Gary and Barb Zumbiel loaded up their car and are driving to Baltimore, Maryland to deliver the quilts to, uh, some of the quilts to Lutheran World Relief, where they will be sent out to places in need all over the world and in the U.S. Uh, also, they distributed quite a few through local uh, ministry partners also. So thank you for that gift of your time in preparing those quilts. Now we begin, oh, the words of institution. Um, yeah, that was the quilt thing. Yeah, I want to make sure and get that in today. So let's prepare for Holy Communion. For those of you at home watching, make sure that you have your wine and your bread ready uh, as we will be participating together in Holy Communion. And for those of you here, did everybody pick up their communion cup on the way in? Yes? If you need one, raise your hand. We will get it to you. Okay. All right. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, he took a cup filled with the fruit of the vine. And after giving thanks, he shared it with them. And he said, take and drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now let us pray.
Lord, reformation, it's all about our hearts. It's about our relationship to you and about your relationship to the world through us. We thank you for the forgiveness which fuels our love for each other and our ability to make things right. Continue to bless us with your forgiveness and your love that our hearts will be working for you in all that we do. We thank you for the faith and the zeal of all the reformers who sought to recover or preserve the precious pearl of great price, the gospel of our Lord, the gospel of salvation. And thank you for all the faithful people in every land and every age who have preferred nothing whatsoever to Christ Jesus and him crucified. Lord, we ask that you keep us in their company and keep our faith warm and pure through the life-giving fire of your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon your church and make it your habitation. Keep it steadfast to your word. Strengthen it in the face of all temptation. Defend it from evil. Reform and purify it from sin and error, error. And bestow on it your saving peace. Graciously protect and guide the people of this congregation. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, gladden our hearts with the joy of your saving love. Cause us to brim over with the gifts of your Spirit so that we may refresh, nourish, instruct, and invite our neighbors into your presence through our lives. Lord, presidential election seasons are always moments of great tension in our land especially when a pandemic is among us. We ask, Lord, that you would move us toward unity and purpose once our votes are counted. We give you thanks today for all who have participated in making quilts for this last year. Their hands have been fruitful, and we now send these quilts all over the world to places where they are needed to bring warmth comfort and shelter. Bless Gary and Barb as they drive to Baltimore today. We pray for Hebron Lutheran Church, our sister congregation, as they install their new pastor, Michael Stoops, direct and guide their work in the coming months as they begin this new and important relationship in their life together. We give you thanks for momentous occasions. We thank you for Rachel and Dane who were joined in marriage this week. We ask that you bless their lives and their relationship. We pray for all those who celebrated significant birthdays this week. One among us is Kim who turned 50. We ask that you continue to bless her. And we lift before you the needs of all whose lives are shaken and troubled by any suffering of mind or body or spirit. So we pray especially for Julie, Janet, Dorothy, Lucille, Nancy, Rosetta, for those we name in our hearts and in our minds. Be in their midst. Let them not be overthrown. Bring them your saving help and say to them, be still and know that I am God and restore them all to health and hope that they may proclaim the awesome things that you have done. And Holy Father, we thank you for the lives of all your faithful people, prophets, apostles, martyrs, theologians, confessors, teachers, pastors, and all the ordinary saints whom you have redeemed through the precious blood of your dear Son. We pray that you receive into your loving arms Clyde Wilson and Mrs. Mor Morline. Be with their families through this time. Help them to see in death the, the gate of eternal life. And grant that we may humbly follow in their footsteps, boldly trust in your promises, faithfully live in your word, cheerfully serve in your name, and bring us through the merits of our Savior into your eternal home, where with all the redeemed we shall glorify you in the power of your most Holy Spirit forever and ever, and unto the ages of ages. 
For Jesus' sake, we ask that you grant the fulfillment of all we ask that conforms to your holy will. And we pray now together as you taught us to pray. pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Amen. And now we prepare to receive communion. Take your mask off. For those of you at home, at home I hope you have your uh, elements ready. And we're going to invite you, for those who are at, in, at home by themselves, please let us serve you communion today. And uh, if you are in a home setting where you're gathered with others, please gather around your home altar and, and prepare to receive communion. And so I now invite all gathered here to please remove the clear cellophane off the top of their cup and to please pick up the bread and to hold it up in front of you when you are ready. And now... Friends of Christ, this is the body of Christ, broken and given for you. Can we have our, our juice ready? And now, may the blood of Jesus fill you with his heart and his life. May the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace and peace now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let us sing together a mighty fortress. Peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.